Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Wellford in collaboration with RHB Investment Bank. Today, we'll be doing this topic, Unlocking Warrants, a glimpse into the US and China market 2023. My name is Shen Chu. I'm one of the speakers for this session. So I want to extend a warm welcome for you to join this session. Yes, uh, if you are doing great and you can't wait for this session, uh, type one in the chat box and let me know. Yes, thank you so much, everybody, for putting one in the chat box. All right, so today, we are going to look into the uh, outlook for the US market, for the economy outlook, and also the uh, uh, stock market outlook. We also look at the China market outlook and also the economy outlook. Then we will look into some stocks. Uh, we'll do an overview of some of the stocks that I love. And of course, uh, after that, we are going to have the second speaker, uh, our honorable guest from RHB Investment Bank, who will come and talk about how do you use Warren to get into this uh, foreign stock exposure with uh, locally listed structure warrants, okay? So you can gain a uh, foreign exposure with uh, locally listed structure warrants. So that's what we're gonna do today. So allow me to briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Shen Chu. Uh, for those of you who are new to me, I'm the director of Wellphone and Live Champ. I've been uh, training, uh, I've been speaking and investing in the market for over uh, 10 years. I started investing in 2009 and over the past uh, 14 years or so, I have my portfolio in Bursa, Malaysia, in America, in China, in Australia and Singapore as well. So today I've trained over 20,000 people in stock investment. So that's a little uh, brief overview about myself. So today I prepared a lot of content for you. So but only have about 15 minutes time. So I will do my best to go through it as quick as possible. So we can cover as many grounds as possible. All right, so what, is, what I'm going to share today is firstly, we're going to talk about US economy and the market review. Then we'll talk about China economy and market review. Then we're going to do a few case studies of the US and Chinese stock, just a bit of overview. So disclaimer is whatever you share in this session is only for educational purpose. So in no way that I give any recommendation for you to buy or sell any listed securities that we mentioned here. If you decide to make any investment decisions, you're 100% responsible for all your investment risks. Okay, so this is just my view and sometimes my view will be wrong. So you just take it with a pinch of salt, all right? Now let's quickly uh, take a look at the US economy and the market. So for the second quarter of 2023, the US economy expanded and analyzed 2.1%. Okay, for the past four quarters, uh, looks like the GDP growth has slowed down for a bit from 2.7% to 2.6% to 2.2% and 2.1%. For the manufacturing PMI, okay, uh, in September, the S&P Global US Manufacturing PMI rose to 49.8, signifying the slowest decline in manufacturing condition over the past three months. So if you look at the past uh, th uh, three months, um, they are still below the threshold of 50. If the PMI is below the threshold of 50, means it has contraction, the experience contraction. Okay, but last month, September is the slowest decline, slowest contraction. And hopefully uh, next month uh, in October, they are going to uh, back, go back to uh, expansionary phase. Okay, so let's look forward to that. So the output increased moderately and faster since uh, May and job creations remain moderate while new orders fell for the fifth consecutive month due to high interest rate and inflation impacting consumer demand. And the business confidence reached its highest level since April 2022, driven by optimism for improving demand conditions. But what is more important to the US economy is the service sector because service sector is the largest economic sector in US as they are a consumption-driven economy. For the uh, RFM manufacturing, uh, non-manufacturing PMI, which means uh, services PMI, uh, for, the, for the entire 2023, they have been above the 50 threshold. When it's above the 50 threshold, it means that it is on expansionary phase. Uh, however, uh, in September, it eased to 53.6 um, from the six-month high of 54.5 in uh, August. For the inflation rate, now 
uh, for the past one year or so, the inflation rate has eased until the lowest in June 2023 at about 3%. So the market cheers uh, 3%. But however, for the past two months in July and August, um, the inflation has uh, take up for a little bit. So it accelerated for second uh, straight month to 3.7% in August from 3.2% in July. So the increase was driven by rising oil prices over the past two months. And the core inflation rate excludes the food and energy drop to 4.5% in line with expectation. If we take a look at the oil price for the past uh, three months since uh, July, uh, we've seen that the oil price has surged from $70 per barrel to about $90 over dollar per barrel, okay? And in October, it started to decline, okay? If you take a look at this, there seems to be a gap up here. This is due to the uh, Israel, Israel and the Hamas war. So after the Israel and Hamas war broke out, the oil market uh, gap, and then uh, it surged very strongly on the first day, Subsequently, it became subdued for a bit, but then it surged again on uh, last Friday. So will this uh, Hamas-Israel war uh, take the momentum even higher? It remains to be seen. Okay, What is more important is if Iran is in, uh, complicit in uh, assisting Hamas in planning an attack on Israel, then there would be sanctions on Iran and the oil price would may trend even higher. Okay, as the Iran supply is cut from the market. So this is one risk to watch out for. For the US unemployment rate, the, uh, it rose to 3.8% in, uh, in August. is the highest since February 2022. The U6 unemployment rate went up to 7.1% in August, which is the highest since May 2022. U6 unemployment means that it did not take into the consideration of part-time job. So if you are part-timer, you are considered unemployed. So that's U6 unemployment rate. The conventional uh, US unemployment rate is taking U3 data, which includes part-timer. So the labor force participation rate increased to 62.8%, the highest since February 2020. For the US consumer confidence, uh, for, for this year, it is still above uh, 100. Okay, But of course, in the... Uh, September, it declined a bit to 1.3 uh, from August 1.8.7. This is because there's a concern about the potential recession, political uncertainty, and rising interest rate among the consumers. For the US 10-year bond yield, it has uh, gone up to about 4.57 as of last uh, Friday. It is slightly below the 16-year high of 4.8%. Okay, if you take a look at this, uh, this, uh, can you see that my cursor? I think you can see, right? Uh, it start to inch down a little bit. Okay, it was about four point six percent before the uh, Israel and Hamas war broke out. When the war broke out, there's a flight to safety. And when there's a flight to, uh, the U.S. Treasuries, when there's a flight to the uh, uh, U.S. uh, so for it to to gold market, to the U.S. dollar. So the, uh, the yield tumble because there's a slightly more demand to buy the bond. So it, it take down a little bit. So what it means is that um, this is just slightly below the past uh, 16 years high. In other words, that the, the US Treasury bond hasn't been so attractive in the past 16 years. So suddenly it becomes so attractive and the yield has become uh, pretty high because for the past decade or so, there's an extended period when we do the uh, quantitative easing. So when the economy is undergoing a very prolonged period of low interest rate, so the bond yield can't be any higher. Okay. So right now, it appears that the bond market is pretty attractive. Okay. At 4.57%. Uh, so a lot of in bond investors find it attractive because the moment they buy into the uh, US Treasury bond, they lock in the interest rate uh, at about 4.5 over percent. If next year the US Federal Reserve cut the interest rate, it means that the uh the, the bond price will go up where the yields will tumble. So they lock in 4.5 over percent, and when they cut the interest rate, then the bond price will hide because the bond pie will uh, the bond price will move inversely proportionate to the 
uh, the yield because if the yields tumble, the price will go up. So, uh, but of course, since 2020, when the yield uh, start going up, it means that the bond market, uh, the bond price has been coming down for the past three years. So if you are bond investors since 2020, then you should be suffering. Uh, if you're buying into uh, uh, US treasuries for the past three years, you should be uh, having a capital loss. But if you buy now and next year they cut interest rate, then probably you will have capital gain. If we take a look at the broader perspective, a long-term perspective, this is uh, the data uh, I can get uh, for the past one century. Okay, So you see for the recent 40 years or so, for the recent 40 years, the bond yield has been trending down. And it looks like now the app trend, uh, the downtrend was broken. Okay, the downtrend was broken and it each even higher. Uh, will it go higher? Of course, uh, it remains to be seen. Um, so we'll uh we'll see how the market respond to that. And if if the Federal Reserve had to resort to a low interest rate environment again, whereby they have to uh, do a lot of monetary expansion. They got to buy a lot of government, uh, uh, the tr uh, treasury bonds and so on. Then uh, the yield will be going all time low. Then the yield may uh, come back down again. Okay. But if they don't do QE and so on, I think there's a good reason to believe that the uh, yield price, uh, the bond yield price, uh, the bond yield will go higher. Okay. So right now, uh, it is worth to take note that the uh, the three decade, uh, I will see three decade downtrend, or four decade downtrend, trend has been broken. If you take a look at the US Central uh, Bank balance sheet, uh, you see uh, they have reduced their bond holdings by approximately 815 billion US dollars since June 2022. So right now, uh, the, the balance sheet stands at about 8 trillion. Okay. So uh, the past FOMC meeting was held from 19th to 20th of September. The next one that we look forward to is from October 31st to November 1st. So what was the takeaway from September FOMC? The Fed held the uh, Fed fund rates at targeted range of 5.25%, which is the highest about 22 years. The central bank signaled a bias towards a more restrictive policy and higher interest rate, causing market concerns. So the projections indicated one more rate hike in 2022 and two cuts in 2024 with the funds rate around 5.1%. Ec uh, economic growth expectation for 2023 will revise up to 2.1% with a 2024 out GDP outlook of 1.5%, indicating optimism and no recession inside. So the Fed statement reflected the more positive view of economic activity and job gains Uncertainty remains and the Fed continues to monitor development closely. Okay. So the Fed, you know, uh, indicate that, you know, there's no recession inside. Lah. Okay. So if you take a look at the Fed fund rates versus the stock market performance, um, you see for the past two decades, uh, you know, whenever the interest rate goes up, the stock, uh, the stock market go up. The moment they cut the interest rate, the stock market tumble. Okay, the moment they hide the interest rate, the stock market go up. The moment they cut the interest rate, stock market uh, tumble. Okay, and then for this period of low interest rate, is uh, one of the longest run bull bear, uh, bull rally. Okay, and the moment they <laughs> raise the interest rate, the bull uh, the bull rally was extended, and the moment they cut the interest rate, you see uh, shortly after that, you no, know, we have COVID uh, induced uh, crash. Okay, now when they raise the interest rate, uh, it came down for a bit before a U-turn, okay, to go up, okay? So if next year they cut the interest rate, what will happen, okay? If history is our, has, is, uh, can be our teacher, then it's likely that the stock market will, uh, will correct itself, okay? If the data for the past 20 years uh, is to be repeated in the future, when they cut the interest rate, there's a good likelihood that the stock market may come down. So that's what we learned from the, uh, the, uh, from the relationship between the Fed funds rate and the stock market. So if you take a look at the five-year Dow Jones Industrial Average, for the past five years, the, uh, the Dow, Jones have, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average has been uh, trending upwards. So um, 
this pink color one is the uh, 200 day moving average. So you see that the uh, Dow Jones is still trading above the 200 day moving average. So it's still uh, the, down, the uptrend is still intact. If you look at S&P 500, it is still trading above the 200 day moving average. So uh, it is near all time high right now. If you take a look at NASDAQ, it is also trading above the 200 day moving average. If we take a look at the Russell 2000, which is the, which tracks the small cap, uh, this is the only index that trade below the 200 day moving average. But not only it trade below the 200 day moving average, it also trade below the 20 day, 50 day, and 100 day moving average. Okay, so in other words, if you buy into the small caps in America, uh, it's likely that you will experience capital loss. So let's us just break down the S&P 500 by a sector. Uh, we know that the SME Fire has performed fairly well. And if we break down by sector, we'll notice that it is the energy sector that keeps the rally going. Okay, companies like ExxonMobil, okay, is one of the big players under the energy sector. And it's followed by communication services, okay, uh, up by 0.75% in this Q3. Okay, in Q3, only these two sectors uh, are, are, are positive, uh, deliver positive gains. Uh, communication services are companies like uh, Alphabet, um, Meta, Disney. So these are companies in the uh, communication services. All right. Uh, the rest of it, uh, for the, the other nine of them, uh, they uh, delivered uh, losses from in, in Q3. But if we take a look at year-to-date data, year-to-date data at the whole market, if we take a look at the entire market for 2000. Uh, 23, the, uh, the, the market didn't perform as well. Okay. Uh, healthcare is down 23%, uh, is, a, is the worst hit, followed by utilities, followed by consumer defensive. But however, you know, there are three sectors that are in the green, which is which are the industrials, energy, and financial services. But if you take a look at SP 500, which is the final largest listed company in America, it is up by 12%. Okay, uh, even though uh, most of the sectors are down, S and P are up, meaning that the strong cap, uh, sorry, the big cap, uh, uh, strongly outperform the small cap. Okay, so that's why S and P five hundred registered again, even though the uh, the broad market is actually down. So let's take a look at the S and P five hundred earnings to see if the uh, the stock market gain is sustainable. If we take a look at S and P five hundred earnings you notice that the, the earnings per share has been trending upwards, okay? Now we are near the historical high, okay? So this is the past, this is for the past uh, one and a half centuries, okay? Since, eight, uh, since 1800 until 2023, the earnings per share right now is about uh, 178 cents, okay? So this is as of March, this is the latest data, March 2023 is the latest data. So you see that the stock market rally is justified and supported by the earnings. If you take a look at the valuation, this is S&P 500 Schiller uh, PE ratio. The, uh, the Schiller PE ratio is trading at about 29.48, uh, which is very close to the uh, Black Tuesday which happened during the Great Depression, okay, before the Great Depression, okay, the, uh, the, the Great Depression happened in uh, 1929, from 1929 to 1932, so that was before the Great Depression happened, so now we are trading about that kind of P-E ratio, however, that's not the highest shiller P-E ratio, the highest happened in uh, 2000 uh, during the dot-com bubble, and also um, uh, during the uh, post-COVID period. Okay, so the right now we're at 29.58, whereby the historical mean since the inception of S&P 500 is about 17 times, okay? So we are trading above the historical means. If you take a look at the dollar index, this is the US dollar index. It has been uh, trending up for the past five years. It's trading above, uh, 500, uh, above the 200 day moving average. So at one, uh, 106, I'm sure all of you, uh, all of us here feel the pinch, right? When you look at the Malaysian ringgit versus the US dollar, you know it's about four point seven four, okay, which is uh pretty high, right? 
So uh, US dollar is very strong while Malaysian has Malaysian ringgit has weakened against a basket currency, including the US dollar. So uh, of course the US dollar is so strong is a result, is a direct result of the uh, hawkish policy stance from the Federal Reserve. So let's take a look at the treasury use. Okay, if you take a look at the treasury yield across a uh, different bond tenure, the three month uh, bond is trading at about five over five point five over percent of yield, whereby the thirty year bond is traded at about four point seven times kind of uh four point seven percent of yield. So it means that when the uh long dated bond yield is lower than the short dated bond yield, it means that the curve is inverted. Okay, so. If we take a look at the 10 year bond yield versus the three month bond yield, if we take a look at the yield spread, we will notice that right now it is in inversion. Okay, so historically there have been um, uh, many occasions where we have the yield curve inversion. Ever since the World War II, the yield curve inversion has 100% accurately predicted every recession that uh, followed, uh, that comes next. Okay, so ever since World War II, it has accurately predicted, will this time be different? So if you take a look at the conference of Bob US recession probability as of February 2023, this is the latest data, it's them at 99%. Okay, uh, the US conference of Bob is pretty bearish about um, a recession, whereby it's near 99% pointing to the likelihood of recession in the US within the next 12 months. If we take a look at the Federal Reserve own prediction. Okay, the Federal Reserve own modeling predictions is pointing to odds of recession in twelve months. Okay, it's about sixty point eight three percent. They think that Federal Reserve think that for the past for the next twelve months it has about sixty point eight three percent odds of recession. So these are the data from conference on board and the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve. Let's take a look at the. Uh, uh, the survey by the economists in Wall Street, right? So the Wall Street, the Wall Street economists are uh, survey, and they are divided on the ramification of the inverted treasury yield curve. Thirty-eight percent feel that you know there's a declining inflation plus no recession. Thirty-six percent of them surveyed think that there will be a recession in the next twelve to eighteen months. Fourteen percent think that there will be a long-term bond premium and no recession. About 12% indicate other, uh, other factor. Okay. In other words, if you take those that indicate no recession, 14% plus 38%, that means more than half of the analysts surveyed uh, think that there won't be any recession. At most, there will be a soft landing. Okay. So that's how economists think differently than the models, okay, the statistical model point two, okay. So, of course, now we are getting mixed signal, right? Okay, we, from the yield curve is pointing to us that you know there is uh, likely to be a recession, uh, and from economy survey, you know, think that you know more than half of them think that there won't be any recession. Okay, so the indicator is a bit more mixed, uh -huh. In fact, analysts have think that the recession indicator, which means the inverted yield curve could be a broken odometer for the economy. Okay, so if you, let's say, if you believe that if you're on the bearish side, okay, if you think that the economy is going to crash, how should you prepare yourself? So for the past four recessions since uh, 1990s, uh, there have been four recessions. Okay, the first one is here, the second one is here, the third one is here, the fourth one is here. Okay, the first one is after 1990s. Okay, so did the, in, uh, the, uh, did the inversion yield curve happen? Yes. So after it happens and after it uninverts, a few months later, only recession happened. Okay, so the keyword here is uninvert. Okay, if we take a look at the um, dot com bubble, did the inversion yield curve happen? Yes. Okay. When when uh when the yield curve dropped below the zero threshold, it means that inversion happened. So when inversion happened, and the moment it inverts, shortly after that, recession happened. Okay, and then you see the uh, subprime mortgage crisis. Okay, the inversion 
yield curve happen? Yes. And when did it happen? It happened after the yield curve uninvert. A few months after that, subprime mortgage crisis recession happened. Okay. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, did the uh, inversion yield curve happen? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then it happened after it uninverts. Then it happened. Okay. And right now, it looks like the yield curve is in the process of being uninverted, right? So if you're on the bearish side, you think that the recession will happen due to high interest rate environment, then the moment it uninvert, that's the time that we should get ready to be more defensive in our investing strategy. All right. So I've talked about the uh, US economy and talked about uh, the US market. So let's talk about China. All right. So let's take a look at the China GDP growth. Okay. The China GDP, uh, China economy expanded by 6.3% year on year in the second quarter 2023, showing a faster growth compared to the 4.5% recorded in the first quarter 2023. Nonetheless, the latest figure were distorted by a low base of comparison from last year when Shanghai and other major cities were under strict lockdown. Okay, the reason we have 6.3% in the last quarter was because last year corresponding period, it was much lower because the city were under strict lockdown. So there were very little economic activity. But if we take a look at the broader picture, okay, a bigger picture, okay, uh, this is the full year GDP growth for China over the past uh, two to three uh, decades, right? So uh uh, broadly speaking, the China economy can be categorized to three phases. The first phase is during the uh, Chairman Mao Zedong period. Okay, the economy grow uh, uh, economy grow modestly. Uh, is a slow growth. Okay, from nineteen forty nine until about uh, until he passed away in uh, nineteen seventy six. So there were two period of uh, chaos. Okay when there's finding the succession, okay? So the second phase happened when uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping and his gang was elected to be the, uh, the leaders of the country. And Deng Xiaoping was a paramount leader uh, since 1978. So in, uh, in the 1979 period, uh, he liberated the Chinese economy uh, and keep an open door policy. So the moment he did that, the private sector energy got unleashed. So when the private sector energy got unleashed, so the GDP start to go up, accelerate much faster. And in 2001, when, uh, when, the, uh, uh, when China joined the World Trade Organization, uh, when, that's when the GDP accelerated even more, okay, to about double digit, okay? So the phase two was uh, characterized by uh, the leadership uh, from uh, Deng Xiaoping and also his successors, which are Jiang Zemin and uh, Hu Jintao, who carried on with the reform agenda to uh, liberate every sector and uh, put in the uh, market economy into a socialist uh, control e economy. Okay, so they put in a capitalist environment, a uh, capitalist element into a socialist economy. So that's when the GDP uh, go through the roof. Okay. So the third phase of uh, China GDP, uh, China economy is after uh, Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping came to power. So uh, during that period, because of the because of the uh, subprime mortgage crisis, and a lot of people lost their job, right? In America, people lost their job, and people in the world also lose their job, right? So during that time, the uh, I think people felt that American American felt that a lot of Chinese are taking away the manufacturing job. So all the management, manufacturing job has gone to China. So ever since then, you know, there's a build up of the uh, patriotism, nationalism kind of movement. That's why uh, US uh, pres uh, candidate like Donald Trump can be voted into power, okay? So they appeal to that sentiment and he got uh, voted into power. So then it began the US-China conflict, okay? So the US-China conflict started uh, so President Xi Jinping inher inherited the U.S.-China conflict that period since 2012. Ever since he came into power, I think the 
US, uh, the China economy uh, seems on a downtrend as China has to confront America in multiple wars, right? From trade wars, economic wars, technology, uh, technology wars, geopolitical wars, and so on. Okay, so the GDP has been on a decline. Uh, but of course, the 2.2% is during the um, uh, COVID-19 lockdown. And 8.1% is after, you know, uh, you know, the economy get, go back up. Okay, and last year, they got 3%. So that's a brief overview of how China has performed miraculously over the past 40 years. Of course, right now, at the pace of the GDP growth, it is uh, not so fast that it can uh, overtake US in terms of becoming the world's largest uh, power, economic power. Okay, we'll talk about that forecast in the short while. So um, the World Bank now left is 2023 economic growth forecast for China unchanged at 5.1%, but lowered is 2024 estimate to 4.4% from 4.8%. It means that the World Bank uh, is getting more pessimistic for their growth forecast at the moment. If you take a look at the manufacturing data, okay, so in September, the uh, China Chinese manufacturing PMI declined to 50.6 from 51. For the past two months, ever since China vowed to boost the economy, the uh, manufacturing sector uh, has a boost. Okay, it's above 50 threshold. So this is the second consecutive month of sector expansion due to Beijing's efforts to boost post-pandemic recovery. Employment fell due to the cost-cutting measures and not replacing voluntary departures. Purchasing activity increased due to supply chain improvements. Uh, business sentiments declined to 12-month low. Okay, for services, okay, um, Chising China General Services uh, PMI dropped to 50.2 in September 2023 from 51.8 in August, pointing to the softest uh, increase in services activities since the start of the year as demand remained weak despite a string of support measures. Meanwhile, employment increased for the eighth consecutive month. Business sentiment weakened to a 10 month low amid concerns about the market conditions and impact on sales. Okay, so for the past a uh, year or so, uh, since, since uh, 2023, this year, the services PMI has been on expansionary phase. You see, every month is above 50. It's just that since May this year, or since, oh, sorry, March this year, it looks like the expansion has slowed down for a bit. Huh? Now it's very close to drop below the 50 threshold. So China inflation uh, data is unlike the rest of the world. Okay, they have deflationary pressure. Okay, so the rest of the world is coping with you no know, high inflationary pressure. They are the one that's in deflationary pressure. Okay, the consumer prices rose by 0.1% year on year below the expected 0.2% increase. This follows 0.3% drop in the previous month, the first decline in over two years. So the core consumer prices, excluding food and energy, remain at 0.8% year on year, matching July's pace the fastest since January. On a monthly basis, consumer prices grew by 0.3% in August. How about the unemployment? For the China urban unemployment rate, it is it dropped uh, to about 5.2% in August from 5.3% in July. Okay, you see that the trend for the urban unemployment is coming down since 2022, which is a good sign. The jobless rate in 31 major cities and towns was 5.3%, declined from 5.4% in July. The government 2023 target is to have jobless rate around 5.5%, aiming to create 12 million new urban jobs. Okay, so right now they have surpassed their target. Okay. However, one thing remains concerned is that the youth unemployment rate in China increased to a fresh record high of 21.3% in June 2023. And ever since then, they stopped publishing the data. Okay, so the latest data is June. After that, they stopped publishing it. So which is which leads people to wonder when the urban unemployment rate starts to trend down, how come the youth unemployment rate goes up? Of course, there are some people, uh, some uh, analysts who think that uh, that could be because of nowadays the young people don't like to get a proper job. They like to become an influencer. Okay, a key opinion leader. So when you know they are a key opinion leader, they work on their own, so they could be seen as unemployed. 
okay, there are millions of people now who become uh, uh, influencer and you know uh, do a lot of you know uh, online promotion of uh, to sell goods, right? So that's how it contribute to twenty one point three percent. So that's some analysts who seem to think that way, All right? So of course, how true is we don't know, but we, of course, what we know that there's there are a lot of young people who are getting into uh becoming an influencer on WeChat, you know, on uh 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 Douyin, okay. So this is what happened. For the consumer confidence, it increased okay drastically in two thousand twenty three. So increased to ninety four point nine point in March from ninety four point seven point in February. For the ten year bond, okay, uh, similarly like the rest of the world, um, China, uh, uh, bond yield comes down, okay, for the past ten decade, and right now it goes up a bit. But of course, it did not break the downtrend line. Unlike the US, it did not break the downtrend line yet. Okay. So now it's about 2.7%. The central bank balance sheet increased to about 41 uh, trillion renminbi in August. So the central bank is also on uh, is on expansionary phase um, whereby the America one is on tightening. Okay, America's central bank balance sheet is coming down. Okay, so 41 trillion renminbi is about five over trillion US dollar. For the China loan prime rate versus the US uh, stock market, you know that uh, the loan prime rate don't act in the same fashion like how the US federal funds rate affect the stock market. Okay, Sometimes when they cut the interest rate, the stock market go up. Okay, When they keep the interest rate flat, the stock market also rally for, for a bit. And then, you know, so it is, um, it, it works fine. It works fine uh, on the low interest rate environment. When they start to cut interest rate, then the stock market start to go up okay so Beijing also implemented various stimulus measures to support the economic recovery including a cut in interest rate in August and in banks reserve requirement ratio in September in hope to pump more liquidity into the market and uh, China is one of the few countries in the world that is on a cutting interest rate move okay the rest of the banks in the world are actually very hawkish China is one of the few that is very dovish okay if you take a look at the US dollar versus Chinese uh, yuan, you will notice that uh, it has also been on an uptrend. That means uh, uh, Chinese renminbi is uh, weakening against the US dollar, even though there have been multiple efforts to defend the Chinese yuan, but it seems that a lot of foreign investors are selling uh, yuan into the market. Okay, But on the uh, a, a more macro side, okay, uh, if you take a look at you know what happened to extreme poverty over the past decade or so. Um, under uh President Xi Jinping, they have managed to eliminate extreme poverty from ninety eight point nine nine to about zero. Okay, in other words, there's no uh rural residents that live under the extreme poverty uh, line. Okay, and for a number of impoverished counties, from for the past uh ten years it has also come down to zero, okay? So there's an improvement in economic livelihood. If we take a look at the Chinese middle class, by 2020, by 2020 that 26% of the Chi uh, Chinese population are middle class, and 2022, there are 40% of the China population belong to middle class, which is about four, 515 million. So if you can sell goods to this, to China, you see, there are about 550 million middle class who can buy from you, which is a huge market. Uh, which is a huge market. All right. But over the past uh, four decades or so, the China disposable income has been on a stellar rise. Okay. So if you take a look at China billionaire, okay, they outpace US by three to one. Okay, this is according to Reuters. And uh, what was the biggest story? Uh, uh, I think late last month, okay, was that the uh, the launch of a Huawei Mate 60 Pro, okay, and this is a revolutionary breakthrough because none of its part is using the US technology, okay, despite all the technology sanctions, uh, into Huawei, 
whereby they cannot use um, a lot, they cannot use any US technology, chip making technology. They cannot even use uh, the ASML lithography machines. And they still manage to produce a 5G phone that is compatible to the high end phone uh, by America. Okay. And when the analyst uh, take out the phone and examine parts by parts, they found none. Okay. No parts of this phone is using any US technology, which is incredible. So um, despite all the sanctions and stopping all the US companies from selling their, uh, their chips to, uh, to China, China is able to come up with a product that is uh, homemade that can rival the best from America. Okay. So now it means that all these US companies who is used to selling their services and their products to China, they will lose the Chinese market forever. Okay. So this is a good news coming up from China. So if you want to buy in the China and you don't know how, so these are uh, uh, the three shares that uh, three Chinese shares categories that you can consider uh, can you need to know. Okay. The first is A shares. So what are A shares? A shares are publicly listed Chinese company that trade on the stock, Chinese stock exchange. So this trade in uh, renminbi. Okay. B shares means domestically listed foreign investment share. They list on uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen stock exchange and trade in foreign currency like US dollar and Hong Kong dollar. And third classification of shares are H shares. Okay, so they, they are traded on Hong Kong stock exchange and are regulated by the Chinese law and freely tradable by anyone. So these shares trade using Hong Kong dollar. So most of the time I trade uh, H shares. I invest more in H shares. Okay, because H shares usually trade a discount compared to the A shares. So they have this attractiveness. But of course, if you want to buy A share, which are slightly more speculative, you can go through Stock Connect. Okay, Stock Connect can allow you uh, to give you a northbound flow into the China underlying. If you take a look at the China uh, Shun, uh, Shanghai uh, index performance over the past five years, uh, they actually uh, right now it looks like they're on a downtrend. Okay, because they trade below the two hundred day moving average. Okay, um, but Shanghai composite index may not be a good indicator of the confidence in the stock market because the uh, the chi the, these are all these company the state owned enterprise SOE they are listed under Shanghai Stock Exchange and they could be influenced by the directive from the government okay in other words if the government wants that the share price to go up they could instruct you know SOE Okay, uh, you know, instruct them to buy the stocks so the share price could, could uh, the share price could go up. So it may not be a good indicator of the real sentiment in the market. Okay, that's what I believe lah. Okay, if you take a look at Hang Seng Index, so this is the for the past five years, Hang Seng Index has trend down. Okay, uh, to about seventeen thousand points. Okay, in fact, they are almost, uh. 50% discount compared to their 2018 high. The best way to gauge the sentiment in the Chinese market is look at, in my opinion, Hang Seng China Enterprise Index. Okay, Hang Seng China Enterprise Index, HSCEI, is the best indicator for the foreign sentiment against the uh, Chinese market. Okay, because it tracks the Chinese. Uh, companies uh, listed in Hong uh, HS listed in Hong Kong. Okay, so it looks like now they are uh, is also down quite a bit lah. In other words, the foreign investor don't feel so much confident about the Chinese market. So what is unique about the Hong Kong stock market? If you are very new to Hong Kong stock market, so let me share if you are unique about the Hong Kong stock market. There are about one point five million active investor active. Okay. And almost 40% trade on margin accounts. Okay. So this is how speculative they are. And they have a strong home bias, only 5% trade in global market. Okay. For Hong Kong, they all trade their own stocks. Okay. They speculate their own stock. Okay. Hong Kong stock exchange is, a, uh, is the most speculative stock exchange in the world. They are participated by more international and institutional investors. Institutional investors from Hong Kong and overseas account for about 65% turnover. They charge high fee in fund management, brokerage costs, and securities tax. So minimum trade unit vary across different stocks and they're famous for the uh, trading volume and new IPO, okay? So um, so because they are quite high fee, 
So one way for you to lower your cost, okay, uh, of course, is to buy into a, a locally listed, locally listed structured warrants, which give you exposure to the Hong Kong underlying. Also, this is one way for you to uh, get around uh, to invest into the or trade the Hong Kong market. So, what are the Hang Seng indexes? So we have Hang Seng index, which give you uh, uh the, these are the blue chip in listed in Hong Kong. Hang Seng China Enterprise Index, which I, I have told you, which is an indicator for foreign sentiment on the Chinese market. Hang Seng China Affiliated Corporation Index, which tracks the uh, red chips, okay, the red chips in Hong Kong. Hang Seng Composite Index will give you the uh, probably the whole market, very close to the whole market already. Hang Seng Tech Index will give you the uh, indicator of the movement of the technology stocks listed in Hong Kong. And Hang Seng China Hedge Financial Index will give you the uh, the movement or checks the movement of financial stock, 30 largest financial stocks in, in Hong Kong. Okay. So if you break down the Hang Seng index, right, we will realize that out of the seven, sorry, out of the top 10 Chinese companies, so out, out of the top 10 largest market cap constituents under Hang Seng index, seven are Chinese companies. Okay, so these are the likes of Tencent, Alibaba, China Mobile, uh, China Construction Bank, Meituan, uh, CNOOC, uh, and NTS. Okay, so these sevens are Chinese companies. So these rank by market cap. In other words, even though if you look at Hang Seng Index, majority, 70% are really Chinese companies. Okay, the Hong Kong companies are the like of the property companies. Um, like uh, Henderson Land, uh, Sang Hong Ke, uh, New World Development, uh, CK Asset. So these are our property players. And we also have financial players like Hong Kong Stock Exchange, AIA. Um, so these are the HSBC. These are the, these are the financial stocks. Okay. So uh, usually, hung, usually China, uh, Hong Kong stock are mainly financials, properties, commerce. So the rest, especially technology, are mainly Chinese companies. Okay. So to, to look at Hong Kong, you actually look at China. So where do you source the Hong Kong listed company and report? Uh, usually we can go to an uh, investor relation of a listed company, or we can go to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, or we can go to the AA stocks. Uh, my favorite is AA stock. Uh, it has it is in uh, three languages: in English, in um, traditional Chinese, and also in simplified Chinese. Okay. But bear in mind that Hong Kong follows a semi-annual reporting of financial statements, and H share companies and uh, Gem is the second board uh, listed company that require the file quarter reports. Interim reports is unaudited. Okay, so what is uh new in Hong Kong is that you know uh, Hong Kong trade volume is actually in um, uh, uh quite low uh quite low at the moment. It's actually quite low at the moment. So the uh, task uh, there's one task force that set up to investigate how do they increase the volume and the trading value. And of course, one of the uh, schemes that they roll out is this uh, Hong Kong dollar running big dual counter model. So uh, they are opening up to about 24 companies. So what, what it means? It means that uh, um, they allow the Hong Kong stocks to trade in dual currencies, Hong Kong dollar and Chinese running big. Okay, so the southbound trade from uh, 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 from China can trade Hong Kong stock using, can trade his shares using uh, Chinese renminbi. They don't have to convert the renminbi into Hong Kong dollar before they can buy his shares. So because they also realize that there's a lot of offshore uh, yuan that are in Hong Kong. So this offshore yuan need to park at somewhere to get used. So they introduce this uh, Hong Kong uh, renminbi dual model, okay, dual counter model. So it's open, there are about 24 companies on the list that they can trade in uh, renminbi. I think they are working at uh, solidifying this idea, okay. So this could be a good boost to the uh, Hong Kong uh, market. Of course, what is more encouraging is the commitment from the central government, okay? And then China has vowed to boost private economy and protect businesses. For the part in, I think in the President Xi Jinping third term, um, or before the third term, there have been a lot of, uh, since I think the middle of the second term, there has been a lot of regulatory crackdown 
on technology sector, education sector, uh, many sectors as well. So they are doing an overhaul to the economy uh, uh, policies. Okay, so so a lot of sectors are curtailed. In, uh, of course, the large, the biggest hit is property, but right now, uh, after realizing that the market has the economy has slowed down, uh, uh drastically, and has become quite sluggish, the central government has vowed to boost private economy to protect the private businesses. So we are seeing increasing sign of improvement. And we are seeing uh, a lot of policy actually being loosened up. As of the moment, the Chinese stock market, as what I have sh uh, shown you just now, is actually trading at a very attractive valuation. Uh, the valuation is actually at about COVID-19 low, even though the economic activity is already way above the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic low. But the valuation is close to the COVID-19 pandemic law. Okay, so it is quite attractive at the moment. So um, just when we talk about the uh, China GDP, so we see that the GDP has uh, tumbled quite a bit and next year IMF only forecasts four over percent. So if this, if they cannot achieve more than 6% and above, um, it's not easy to overtake China. I think in the past, it was forecasted that um, the China will overtake US by 2030, but looks like you know, uh, the Bloomberg forecast is good. They uh, if the current trajectory carry on, they will only take uh, overtake US by mid 2040s. And what I learned over the past uh, years investing in China, uh, through all my drawdown in capital and so on is we have really have to understand not only the capital market but also understand the government okay investing in china require us to really study about the government because even though uh you know but we know that they are a communist country and this is um uh the, the country is the economy is pretty much controlled even though they are capitalist element but the government's uh, decisions could easily tighten okay the economy so investors like us are exposed to policy risks. So it is of paramount importance and it is imperative for us to really understand the government and understand the direction. If you want to go against the government direction, you're doomed to lose a lot of money. Okay? So it's better that we understand the policy and go alongside the policy. And if there's any indication of policy change, it is very important for us to really uh, adjust our portfolio. So over the years investing in China, this is the lesson that I learned. Okay, really need to understand the government direction. All right. So uh, of course, the biggest risk to watch is also the US-China tension. Okay, nowadays, geopolitics is shaping the economy with all the sanction of technologies. It, it limits where the technology go to. Uh, nowadays, a lot of U.S. technologies are flowing out from China and go to India, go to Vietnam. So these are the countries that receive um, the, the good inflow of the U.S. technologies and so on, and they develop the manufacturing sector. Okay, So if we don't study geopolitics, then we may miss out on all the boom in a certain sector. So it is increasingly more important for us to understand geopolitics because it is really shaping the world economy right now. So for the US-China tension, it's important for us to watch. Of course, the uh, uh, we will we'll see whether the narrative for the, uh, uh, the, the China and the Taiwan tension can be eased as well. So these are the biggest risks to watch. Okay, so let me, uh, let leads me to the last uh, section of today, which I want to talk about case studies. Okay, so uh, I've invested in US and China for a good number of years. And here are some companies that I like. Okay, so uh, for for I like these few American companies due to the uh, uh, highly predictable uh, nature of the business and their consistent performance. So this is the world largest cap company, Apple. Okay, now you take a look at the uh, Apple. Okay, for the past decade, their revenue has been growing. Okay, indicated by the blue line. The net income has also been growing, okay, consistently. Okay, um, cash has grown somehow, okay. 
Um, operating, operating cash flow has also grown consistently. And dividend, okay, there's a outflow of dividend to pay the investor, okay? And a free cash flow is also growing consistently. So total asset also growing consistently. So this is a very consistent company, at least in America, and that's delivered phenomenal returns for investors. Over the past 10 years, the annualized return a year is about 25.95%. If you just buy and hold for 10 years, is 25.95 percent. Uh, the second company is Microsoft. Okay, this is also another company that I like. For the past 10 years, the revenue is, has been increasing in a very consistent way. The net profit is also increasing. Okay, operation cash flow is also increasing. Free cash flow is also increasing. Okay, dividends, they are consistent outflow of dividends to shareholder. Okay. And of course, the stock, uh, the stockholders' equity is also increasing along with the asset. Okay, and I think the bigger story for Microsoft last week was that after a one whole painstaking year of dealing with about three jurisdictions, uh, U.S., European Union, and also uh, U.K., uh, finally they are able to acquire Activ Activision uh, Blizzard. Okay, so this is a video gaming company. That they have final, uh, they have finally acquired. Um, so if of course if you had got into a, uh, Activision Blizzard shares, okay, before the acquisition, and you bet that you know the acquisition will go through, now you will have about fifty percent gain, huh, in your share price. Okay, so now they have acquired uh the one of the largest video game company. If you invested in Microsoft over the past ten years, your your 10-year annualized return is 25.12%, buy and hold only, okay? The third company that I like is Meta, okay? Uh, Meta, we also seen that Meta has grown their sales for the past 10 years consistently. The net profit has also grown consistently. Of course, last year wasn't a good year, it came down. But of course, if you bought at the low, this year you stand to earn a lot in terms of their performance uh, stock rebound. The cash has also gone up, but uh, since past two years, there are a lot of investment into uh, Metaverse, so the cash has depleted, but the debt has gone up for a bit. Operation cash flow has also grown consistently. Um, free cash flow has also grown consistently. Okay, there's no dividend from Meta. Okay, equity has also performed, has also grown consistently. Asset has also grown consistently. So market cap is seven hundred eighty-four billion. Okay, ten-year annualized return is nineteen point five eight percent. If you invest in Meta, hold for ten years, buy and hold, nineteen point five eight percent. So I highlight a few Chinese company that I uh like. Okay, they are fundamentally strong. However, of course, the share price will be turned down lah. Okay, so they now trade at PE at about ten plus. You know, mid teens level. So which is pretty which is pretty attractive. But uh, we go up, we don't know, okay? So we got to see the government direction as well, okay? But fundamentally, as a business, you see um, Tencent, okay? The world largest uh, gaming company has seen the share price, uh, sorry, has seen the revenue increasing over the past 10 years, okay? Of course, the dip was due to the, uh, uh, the crackdown, huh? the gaming crackdown. Operation cash flow has been increasing. Okay, free cash flow has also been increasing. Cash is also increasing. Shareholders' equity is also increasing. Okay, ten-year annualized return is, however, fourteen point seven four percent. You see, investing in China, uh, is not so attractive because the past couple of years has been horrible. Alibaba is also another company that I like. For the past ten years, okay, the share, uh, the revenue has been growing consistently. Okay, operation cash flow growing consistently. Free cash flow growing consistently, cash growing consistently, shareholders' equity also growing consistently. For the past five years, okay, because at, uh, Alibaba hasn't been listed for more than 10 years, so I can't see, get a 10-year data. Okay, the five-year data is negative 11.55%, okay, because of the crackdown on Alibaba. All right? So, but does that mean, mean that they're a bad company? I think not, lah. Huh? It's just that, you know, the market hated them because they go against the country's direction. All right, so I have done an hour for my talk. So without, I, I hope that I've given you a glimpse into the US and China market over the past hour or so. 
And uh, before we go to Q&A, I will want to invite the next speaker, Andrew, to tell you about how do you uh, get foreign exposure into the US market, into the Chinese market with a locally listed structure warrants. Okay, so over to you, uh, Andrew. Okay, thank you very much, Shane, for your insights into the US and Chinese market and what's happening on the global stage. Um, so on my side, I will be talking a bit about how, what are the tools available for investors to take advantage of what they've learned today from Shane. Uh, Shane, I think you need to stop the screen share. Okay, I uh, hope everybody can see my screen now. So what are the tools you can use or one of the tools you can use to take advantage of your market views is actually a structured warrant, right? Now, first question, maybe, you know, some of you have traded in structured warrants before, but some have not, right? So we're just going to a bit of the uh, basics of it, which is what is a structured warrant, right? A structured warrant is an instrument that derives its value from a mother share, an underlying share. Okay, and this underlying share could be a share listed in Malaysia, it could be a share listed in Hong Kong or US. Okay, and um, generally, these warrants are issued by investment banks like ourselves, RHB Investment Bank. And there are certain terms like the expiry date, where you know it's a fixed tenure, price, ratio, gearing, all these things, right? Now, we'll go into that in a little bit uh, in a short while. So, um, first of all, we want to highlight that, you know, in Malaysia, it's a very vibrant structured warrant market um, where RHB Investment Bank alone has 127 warrants on the market with um, 12 from, from Hong Kong listed stocks and six over US listed stocks. So yes, you can take advantage of structured warrants to gain levered exposure to Hong Kong and US listed stocks. So there are two primary types of structured warrants available on the market. And I'll try to keep this session a bit shorter because I understand that it's a... Uh, Everybody has burning questions about the market outlook. <laughs> so um, two main types of structured warrants, the call warrant and the put warrant. Now, what's the difference between these two? A call warrant is basically you are exposed to the shares, um, share price as if you're buying the shares, right? Where it goes up, where the share price goes up, your warrant value goes up as well. And the on the other side, the put warrant is the opposite, where you make money if the share price goes down. So these are the main differences of a call and put warrant. Everything else is the same. It's tradable on Bursa Malaysia. Now, today we'll talk a bit more about call warrants because that is by far the most popular warrant available on the market. Now, why, why would investors choose a structured warrant, right? Now, the number one and the biggest benefit of a structured warrant is the leverage. Leverage on a structured warrant, especially on foreign listed shares like Hong Kong and US market, is one of the best ways or one of the only ways that um, local investors can get leverage over Hong Kong and US listed shares. But one thing we should know that about leverage is although yes, it comes with bigger profits because obviously you put less money for a larger exposure, investors should also be wary that it can come with bigger losses as well. Okay, so what are the other benefits of a structured warrant? Now, the first two points we have here, we already went through it. You know, um, leverage gives you larger upside compared to buying the mother share directly. And the second point is very interesting because we did say that losses are amplified, but it can also be limited. And I will go into that real quick in a short while, in a in a little bit. Now, if you look at this chart on the right, this shows how leverage works versus a mother share. Um, this is an example of a warrant Alibaba C26 against the mother share 9988 in Hong Kong. That's the stock code, Alibaba. Right, where you see where the share price comes down a little bit here, the warrant price comes down more in percentage terms. But when it goes up, the warrant price goes up a lot more as well. Okay, so amplifying the gains and losses, that's what a structured warrant can do. Now, it's easy to buy on a on a Bursa Malaysia, as um, we will be RHB Investment Bank is a market maker for our structured warrants, where we aim to provide bid and ask prices so that investors can enter and exit with sufficient liquidity at all times. Um, it's cheaper to buy a structured warrant because of the leverage factor. 
as well as um, potentially allowing investors to hedge against losses, uh, large stock losses. Now, what do we mean by that, right? So first, let's take a look at a quick example of uh, Microsoft, our structured warrant Microsoft C3, MSFT C3, is uh, one example that we can use it to compare against the mother share. So let's say you, you know, Microsoft share price is 328 US dollars now, and you want to buy 100 shares. Now, all this, we assume the exchange rate is 4.5 times, yeah? So let's say you bought 100 shares and that costs you 147,600 ringgit, very expensive to buy uh, US listed shares, right? If you want to buy a sizable amount. And for example, the share price goes up to $350 tomorrow, you would have made a 6.7% return, right? And this translates to a 9,900 ringgit um, profit on your investment, okay? So now let's take a look at Microsoft C3 and the power of leveraging. So when Microsoft's share price is 328, based on our warrant matrix, the price that we will be bid and ask bidding on the Microsoft C3 warrants is 0 0.16 ringgit. So to get the equivalent exposure, you need to buy about 180,000 units, which costs only 28,800 ringgit. Now, when the Microsoft price goes to 350 US dollars, our warrant price will be 21 and a half cents, which is represents a 34% gain. So you can see that the total profit you make because of leveraging is the same despite putting less money in. Now, when we talked about uh, structured warrants just now, we mentioned about losses being limited. Yes, upside is levered, downside is also levered. But what do we mean by losses being limited, right? So in this example, let's say the worst case scenario, you know, people are predicting that a recession will happen in the next 12 to 18 months and whatnot, what forth, right? So let's take a look at an example where let's say Microsoft's share price crashes tomorrow, okay? So you bought it at $328, it crashes to $100. You would have lost 69%. And that's 102,600 ringgit loss if the share price crashes. Now, if you'd have gone with the warrant to get a similar upside, what happens when the share price crashes? Let's say your warrant loses all its value and you know its value is zero now. You would have only lost the amount you've invested, which was a 28,800 ringgit. So in this sense, to get a similar upside exposure, your downside is also capped at 28,800 ringgit, which is the amount you invested. So this is how we say that structured warrants can give you a levered exposure while capping the downside. Now, of course, you can double up the exposure to 56,000 ringgit or 360,000 units of warrants and double your upside while still capping your downside as well. So, you know, it, it's a powerful tool for investors to use to gain exposure to foreign, foreign uh, shares or even local shares while ensuring that the amount that they stand to lose is kept at whatever they invested in. Okay. So now let's just go through a few key terms that we want to talk about when it comes to investing in using structured warrants. Now, the first of all, we talk about sensitivity. What is sensitivity? Now, sensitivity basically means that how many ticks that a mother share needs to move before your warrant moves one tick, right? So in this example here, we have a example where the warrant sensitivity is 1.5 ticks. That means on average, the mother share needs to move 1.5 ticks for the warrant to move one tick. Now you say, oh, you know, why is the warrant only moving one tick when the mother share move one and a half? Well, the base price of the warrant is also lower. So in this example, you look at about 10, 11 cents. A one tick movement is about a 5% change, whereas one tick for the mother share is only 1%. So this is how you see the leverage effect coming into play again. Now, the second thing we want to talk about is uh, effective gearing. What is effective gearing? This will tell you how much leverage you get from a structured warrant. So for example, here we have a gearing of uh, four times. What this means is that if the mother share moves 1%, your warrant should be moving by 4%. So this gives an investor an idea of you know, how geared a certain structured warrant is. And of course, all this is comparable across all structured warrants listed on the market on our website. Um, let me see if I can get it up now. Yes, uh, this is RHB's um, warrants website where you can just go to toolbox here and go to warrant search. If you want to compare all structured warrants on the market, you can just click on all issuers 
and you can see and compare every single structured warrant available on the market along with its necessary details like sensitivity and gearing, as well as exercise price and basically all the details you need to know about a structured warrant. All right, back to the slides. Now, the third thing we want to talk about today is warrant moneyness. What is moneyness? What is in the money? What's at the money? What's out of the money? When we say that a warrant is in the money, that means that the share price is above the strike, uh, the exercise price. So let's say, for example, a warrant has an exercise price of one ringgit, right? A warrant that's in the money means the mother share is trading above one ringgit. A warrant that's at the money, the mother share is trading at, at one ringgit. And out of the money means the warrant, the mother share is trading below one ringgit. So how does this affect the details and the terms of, not terms, but the features of a warrant? Okay. So generally speaking, a warrant that's in the money will have a higher price because of intrinsic value, higher sensitivity. That means that the mother share needs to move less before the warrant moves and the lowest gearing because a large portion of the warrant shares would be intrinsic value. A warrant at the money will be medium for everything because it's right, you know, right uh, where the exercise price is. And an out of the money warrant would generally have the lowest price because there's no intrinsic value. But however, it also has a lower sensitivity, but a higher gearing ratio because when a warrant price is low, a small movement in the warrant price will trigger a higher per percentage gain. So that is why out of the money warrants generally have higher gearing as well. Now, lastly, we want to talk about time value of a warrant. And this is very, very important to investors because warrant prices are dictated by two things. One is the time value, one is the intrinsic value. What do we mean by, first of all, what do you mean by intrinsic value? For a warrant where the exercise price is, let's say, uh, one ringgit and the mother share is traded at one ringgit and five cents, that five cents is an intrinsic value. That's what we call an intrinsic value. Yeah. So then the remainder of the warrant value is the time value of the warrant. Time value of the warrant basically means how much time you have left to expiry date. The longer the time, the higher the time value. And as it gets closer to the expiry date, the time value would drop. And one very important thing for investors to take note is that the time value drops faster the closer it is to expiry. So one of the things that we, you know, we talk about structure war when we talk about structured warrants is try to get a longer dated structured warrant because then the time value that you lose when you hold it is lesser. Because if you get if you buy a structured warrant that's closer to mature to expiry. Um, the time value decays a lot faster. And if you hold it for the same period of time, let's say a one week, you lose time value faster than holding a warrant that is very far from expiry. So very important to note when your warrant expires and how, and how much time it has left to expiry to make sure that you don't lose too much in time value as well. Now, so these are some of the key things that we want to talk about structured warrants. Now, we look at some of the stocks that uh, I believe Shane also mentioned earlier. Um, first one is Apple. RHB Investment Bank does have a structured warrant over Apple shares, which is called Apple C17, listed in Malaysia. It has an effective gearing of 5.4 times. And the stock itself actually has quite an interesting uh, analyst uh, recommendation where we're looking at 30, um, well, 52 analysts covering the stock with 34 of them giving buy ratings and 14 on hold ratings. So this is one of the stocks that, you know, Shane was mentioning that has very stable uh, revenue and uh, growth story coming up for it. And it, one new thing that Apple is launching, I believe next year in the first quarter would be the Vision Pro headset, which is, potentially taking uh, all of our experiences with the digital world to a whole new level. So it remains to be seen whether this will be as successful as its other lines of uh, products. However, Apple does have a strong history of creating um, products that are widely adopted by the market. Second one we'll look at is Meta. 
or previously known as Facebook. It's the largest, by far the largest uh, social media company. And it has uh, 59 buy, buy calls amongst um, all the analysts covering the stock, seven hold and two sell calls. Okay, um, Using Meta C13, which is an RHB issued structured warrant, you get a 2.9 times effective gearing, meaning you can lever up on Meta stocks if you are bullish on um, this counter. And uh, next we have uh, Microsoft C3. Actually, Microsoft C3 is, uh, or Microsoft itself is actually one of my uh, preferred investments. <laughs> because um, if you look at the history of Microsoft, it has a very, very long uh, track record of uh, monetizing its uh, innovations. And um, one thing we all know is that being innovative is not good enough. You need to know how to monetize it as well so that you bring benefits to shareholders. Now, Microsoft has uh, 63 analysts covering it with um, a vast majority of them having a buy call on it. Now, what makes Microsoft so interesting is that it's a multifaceted company, right? Maybe we all know it only from Windows, but we, are, uh, we need to know that they also have things like Xbox. They have things like... Um, enterprise cloud solutions. In fact, you know, all of us in the office, in most offices worldwide are using Microsoft solutions for Outlook, Word, PowerPoint. So it has become so integrated in our lives that we probably cannot live without the software provided by Microsoft. So Microsoft C3 is one very interesting uh, structured warrant as well with a gearing of 4.6 times. So um, investors can get a levered exposure to Microsoft shares. And just to highlight the consensus target price, meaning the average target price of all the analysts covering the stock is $396, which is uh, quite a bit higher than the $327 uh, last traded on the market. Moving on to the Hong Kong market, um, Alibaba, one of the stocks that has been beaten down quite a fair bit over the past one to two years period because of certain um, disagreements with the Chinese government. We also offer Alibaba C30 structured warrant over Alibaba shares. And interestingly, amongst all analysts who cover these stocks, meaning people who are you know, actively, constantly looking at Alibaba stocks and the company itself, 39 of, out of 40 have a buy call on Alibaba with a 12-month target price average of 136 Hong Kong dollars. Now, Alibaba C30 gives uh, investors an opportunity to get a levered exposure 4.8 times over Alibaba shares, as well as potentially capturing some kind of an upside if there's, a, there's any regulatory action in China to boost the stock market as well. Now, Alibaba previously has been one of the um, disliked child of China because of uh, you know, the said disagreements. <laughs> However, you know, since uh, earlier this year, I believe when they decided to split up the company into six different entities to focus on core businesses, shelving plans for their micro, uh, not shelving, but reducing the prominence of their microfinancing business, they may or they seem to be coming back in a bit of a good graces of the government. So potentially, you know, Hong Kong market generally news and event driven and policy driven. So there's more volatility in the Hong Kong market which gives investors using structured warrants and on levered exposure a greater chance to benefit from said volatility. And last but not least, we want to look at Tencent C35, which is uh, our structured warrant issued over Tencent Holdings. Now, Tencent is by far the largest uh, tech company in China. Um, they operate in all sorts of, uh, all facets of Chinese life, from WeChat to games to many other things, right? e-payments and all that. And they also have a very strong buy rating from analysts who cover this stock. Now, um, one one thing to know about Tencent is, um, I think we all know them from the we, was it WeChat, WeChat uh, app that is used in China. And over here in Malaysia, we mostly use it as a equivalent to WhatsApp. But in China, WeChat is used for so much more than that. And being so entrenched in the daily lives of um, more than 1.3, 1.4 billion citizens is um, 
is a very good uh, exposure to we to Tencent itself and its ability to monetize um, that kind of uh, uh, audience as well. Now, next, we want to talk about our warrants website. So now you've learned a bit more about structured warrants. How do you use this information? How do you use the information that you know to trade structured warrants effectively? Uh, first of all, we have this warrant search function, which I've shown you earlier briefly. This warrant search function allows you to compare structured warrants of either the uh, same counter. So let's say, for example, we look at the search function and we look at uh, Alibaba, right? Alibaba itself, there's many structured warrants available for, on the market itself from different in, uh, investment banks. And of course, we prefer that if you would buy an RHV warrant. <laughs> However, we understand that, you know, what we have available on market doesn't always cater to what the investor is looking for. So choose the right warrant for you, whether you want one that's very sensitive and moves faster when the mother share price moves, or you want one that's very levered up. So you, you see here, you have some 15 times uh, leverage, which is our C26 Warren. However, one very important thing to note just now when we were talking about it as well is the expiry date of a structured warrant. So always look at the expiry date of a structured warrant and general recommendation is, and not a specific recommendation, but just generally, uh, investors might want to look at a structured warrant where the expiry date is further away generally however if you feel that the other specs of a structured warrant that is closer to maturity to expiry um, suits your requirements more than you know and it it is still within your uh, planned holding period by all means choose the one that suits you best the other thing we want to showcase on our website is the warrants matrix function so what is a warrants matrix? A warrants matrix basically shows you what us as the market maker will be bidding and asking a warrant at on market corresponding to the share price of the mother share. So for example, here we can see for Microsoft and Microsoft C3, which we talked about briefly earlier, that you know when it's at $327.50, you're looking at a bid ask price for the structured warrant at one 16 cents and 16 and a half cents ringgit and then if it goes up to 350 dollars you're looking at 21 half 22 cents so in this way it's a lot easier for investors to know exactly where they can take profit and where your warrant price should be when the mother share is at a certain level okay so where to find our website and use all these tools to your benefit, warren.rhbgroup.com. Or even easier, you just Google Warren RHB. And that's the first thing that will pop up. Okay, so please make sure to use this powerful tool. It's completely free for investors. However, do note that the price matrix and the live price matrix is only available for RHB listed warrants. Or RHB issued warrants, sorry. Okay, so warren.rhbgroup.com. We also will send out daily, uh, no, sorry, uh, occasional, not daily, occasional information about trading warrants and how you can learn more about what's happening in the market, breaking news, as well as um, ideas and educational pieces in our warrants in focus section. And we do have a, uh, this is where you sign up for the warrants in focus in a mailing list. And we do have a Telegram channel as well where we, more regularly post breaking news and things that affects the structured warrants that you trade. So do scan this QR code and you can join us on our Telegram channel where we will be posting regular updates on the structured warrants that we issue. And if it's a structured warrant that you purchase, that may be very helpful to you to get timely information. Okay. Um, I believe that's all from me. Um, the standard disclaimer, there's no recommendations made. Um, and uh, <laughs> please um, make your own informed decisions when you trade structured warrants as well, or even equities directly. Thank you very much. Uh, Shane, shall we move into the Q&A session? Absolutely. So if any question to ask any of us, you may write in the Q&A box here. Yeah? Uh, I think, Andrew, maybe you can put the Telegram link in the chat box so everybody can uh, 
for those that have missed the QR code, you can, they can click the link to join your Telegram. Uh, uh, yes, I think my colleague Vanessa will put it into the chat box. All right, so we have got a few questions on my panel right now. Maybe Andrew want to take it? The first question is, do we trade in Malaysian Ringgit for Hong Kong underlying structured warrants too? Ah, okay. So all structured warrants in listed on Bursa Malaysia will be traded in Ringgit. Mm. Okay. So the next question is, um, Andrew, how do your warrants move during Asian hours when the US market is closed? I think, I think this is in reference to your US underlying warrants. Okay, so um, structured, how do we, okay, so structured warrants for US listed stocks, generally the bid us is static during our Malaysian trading hours, and then it changes the next day where the bid us is after the US market trades. So one thing for that might be good for investors is you don't need to worry about the warrant price moving during market hours when you're working or when you're busy doing your going about your day. The warrants for US listed stock is static during the Malaysian trading hours. So at any point in the day you want to buy and sell, it's still there. So uh, it means that the warrant price will often gap. Am I right? Depending All right. So you'll just price of the US market. Yes, it moves overnight. Mm. Okay. The next question is by Ping Chang. Can you explain more on sensitivity and gearing? Are they interrelated? Um, yes, somewhat, but um, not really either. Okay, so <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, we talked about sensitivity, right? Sensitivity is um how much your mother share needs to move before your warrant price moves one tick. And um Gearing is how many times your warrant price moves in relation to the mother share, right? So in a sense, this on the face of it, these two things don't look very related. However, yes, it is related because um, sensitivity and gearing are some of the features of a structured warrant that is uh, derived from where the mother share is and the terms of a structured warrant like the exercise price, uh, time to maturity, and blah, 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 right? So when you say are they interrelated, in a sense they are because when you know when we went through just now where where the mother share is or warrant is called in the money, where the mother share is price is above the exercise price of a structured warrant, generally what happens is you'll see that the sensitivity of the warrant is um, very sensitive, right? It's more sensitive. However, the gearing is lower. So usually they are somewhat inversely related, not all the time, but usually they are inversely related. Mm, thanks for clarification. Uh, there's one question from Alfred who wished to ask, do we need deposit to trade call and put warrants? Okay, so um, co trading call and put warrants is the same as trading a share in your share trading account, right? It's, you just put in the ticker that you want to purchase. And um, if your brokerage firm requires you or your investment bank requires you to put a deposit before you trade, then yes, you do. If it doesn't, then no, you don't. So it's just the same as trading shares, basically. Mm, all right. Thanks for clarifying. Peter Soon would like to ask, how much RHB charge per trade for the commission? RHB doesn't charge. A, so us as an issuer, we don't charge a commission for trading our structured warrants. Um, but of course, um, brokerage fees, standard brokerage fees will apply for whichever platform you're using. Okay. So in other words, I just want to add on to that is that you don't need an RHP stock broking account to trade RHP warrants. No, you can, you can trade any broker, any, any, any brokerage brokers, uh, that has access to Bursa Malaysia. That is right. So, uh, uh, so how much you need to pay to trade warrants? It depends on how much your brokers charge you. Okay. Yep, that's correct. So the next question by Kao Li Shi is, do warrants apply fractional shares or odd lots? So what do you do if you have these kind of circumstances happen? When warrants have an odd lot, 
yeah. So I think generally, stru- for structured warrants, you know, you buy one structured warrant, you will still have one structured warrants. Like we generally don't, you know, there's no like corporate action on the structured warrants in general. So what happens is uh, if you don't buy the if you don't buy an odd lot, then or you gen you can't buy an odd lot of structured warrant if I'm not mistaken. So you won't have an odd lot of structured warrant. But I can't speak for company warrants. Like maybe that one is a bit different. All right. Uh, Maslang would like to ask, will you have to pay any tax in trading structural warrants? Will you have to pay any tax in trading structural warrants? Well, I think based on uh, the budget last Friday, um, if you pay brokerage, you have to pay tax on the brokerage last <laughs> SST. But that's about it. Lah. So on our side as issuer, we don't charge anything. Mm. But your um, respective brokerage may charge uh, brokerage mm. fees and stamp duty and what not might be applicable for those. Okay. So uh, standard fees apply. La. Correct. Okay, like how you trade shares. Yeah. The next question by Julius is that can we view the past history of the Warren prices versus mother share? Like uh, yes, past one can. week. Yes, we can. So let me just show you I believe this is the one. So can you see the screen? Yes, we can okay. see. So oh, you go, you go to the toolbox or in search. And let's say you want to look at Alibaba C30. You scroll down here, Warren price against mother share price. Okay. So on our website, Click on the go to Warren search, click on the relevant Warren, and then you can see the, the comparison between the mother share and the Warren price down here. Okay. Okay. The next question is pretty interesting. Will RHB plan to issue LMVH and also Black Brick structured Warren since the share price is really high? At about hundred dollars, um. So at the moment, we of obviously we take um. We take cue from people like uh, Mister Cow here to see what kind of warrants we want because obviously we want to issue warrants that our investors would like to trade on. So, I mean, if there's demand for LVMH and Black Brick, we can look into it and potentially issue it sometime later this year, maybe. We have to do some uh, market research first. But potentially, I mean, it is a structured warrant that can be issued over. Yeah. So if there are enough interest in the market, then uh, I think issuer like RHP will consider. Lah. All right. Yeah. right. Okay. I, I, uh, and there's one question for me by Maslan. Um, he said that given the fact that the US might be in recession in 2024 and China is not, is it fair to say that it is safer to put your investment in China for 2024 since currently the valuation is at COVID-19 level low? Uh, I think I will take this question, Andrew. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, of course, I have to disclaim that I'm not a licensed investment advisor. I can't give you investment advice. It is uh, safer that you check with your any licensed investment advisor on how do you manage your portfolio. Uh, but the fact that China is... Uh, pretty much in a hard landing right now. Uh, I think that there's um uh a lot of malls uh have very uh has a very bad food traffic. Uh, so uh, people the domestic consumption is pretty low. Um, so I I would at the current valuation I would think that the Chinese market is uh, attractive, but you need to watch out for uh the risk and whether the the uh, Chinese government follow through with their economic transformation plan to make sure that the uh, economy get back on the right footing. All right. So uh, for investment advice, best that you seek a licensed investment advisor. (laughs) All right. Okay. Looks like we have addressed all questions, yeah, Andrew? Yep. No more questions on the panel, okay, from okay. the chat and also from the Q&A. 
All right. So the time is also uh, five minutes past five. So I uh, hope that all of you here, uh, thanks all of you here for tuning in until the end of this webinar. Hope that you have gained enormous value learning from uh, uh, learning from my Cheryl perspective about the market and also learning from Andrew on how you can invest in um, to gain foreign exposure without leaving the Malaysian market. Okay, so these are the few avenues you can gain foreign exposure without leaving the Malaysian market. All right, leave Thanks, foreign Ash. exposure. Yeah, <laughs> to get foreign market exposure, right? Okay, thank you very All much, right. everyone, for tuning in. Okay, thanks, everybody, and have Good a great night. rest of the day. Bye bye.